Welcome to the Marcus Oldham College Ag Talk podcast. This series of podcasts focuses on the business management of Australian farms. G'day, my name is David Cornish. I am the Director for the Centre for the Study of Agribusiness at Marcus Oldham College, an independent tertiary institution that has been producing the next generation of Australian farm managers for over 50 years. The focus of the podcast is to look at the question of what makes a farmer successful. Is it just luck or do good farmers make their own luck through hard work and utilising good business decision making processes? I hope you enjoy the discussion. My pleasure today to welcome an old friend of the podcast back to the microphone, Finn Siebel, Ag Economist for the National Australia Bank. Welcome Finn and how are you going? G'day David, yeah not bad, thanks. Thanks for having me back on, it's, um, it's uh, good to be back. So you're in, still in lockdown? Well, I'm in, I'm in Melbourne, so uh, today being the 27th of July, the day we record this, the announcement's probably about an hour away about whether we're still in lockdown, so I am now. Uh, will I be in a day? Um, that, that remains to be seen, but um, yes, haven't done much over the past couple of weeks. <laughs> it's great that you've been able to join us today. Today, what I'd like to do, Finn, is, is cover off on a couple of things. I want to look at the micro, micro story and then... Uh, sorry, macro story, and then let's let's get down to agriculture. But I suppose one of the things that interests me is that I know we're in the period of COVID, and and every time you come on, listen to the television, it's 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 pretty well doom and gloom. But I've got a couple of numbers here for you, and I just want to throw them past you because, frankly, I think these numbers are pretty good. We've got an unemployment rate at the moment of four point nine percent. We've got an inflation rate of one point one percent. We've got interest rate, cash interest rate around about that zero point one percent. We've got a balance of trade for May, according to um, I think the Reserve Bank, a record 9.68 billion AUD. Okay, um, so that's basically iron ore. If I if I read it, balance of trade, it's all about iron ore. Current currency around 74 cents. I know the GDP is not brilliant. Uh, it's over 1.1, but it's certainly better than it was uh, six months ago. So. Why aren't we all just um, hanging from the rafters and going, what a wonderful job we've done? Well, um, I'll preface this answer, and I'm, I'm going to tee off, uh, so apologies in advance, but I will preface this answer um, with my general like, overall house view, which is that economists, I think we all know this, are generally glum people, they're generally negative people, um, glass half full people. I'm one of those people, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll preface it with that and say, you know, take everything with a, with a grain of salt. Um, having said that, if we'd recorded this podcast two months ago, I would have said things are great. Coronavirus looks to be touch wood under control because we have low vaccination rates. So without high vaccination rates, we have to keep it under control with um, with these sort of aggressive measures. I said, well, it looks like it's under control. People are living normal lives. If you'd asked me uh, March, April last year, our, our unemployment forecast was 12 to 15%. You know, this uh, rapid recovery from from virus conditions where we really suppressed the virus very aggressively. Uh, and then the Commonwealth government spent an unprecedented amount of money, just extraordinary amount of money in both financial support to businesses and individuals. You know, that set us up for this really rapid recovery and the world was recovering as well. Now, with uh, the situation that we see in particularly New South Wales at present, but also these uh, more rapid um, Delta variant outbreaks that we're seeing in other states, uh, I think it's time to sort of reconsider that a little bit and and what it and what it really means. So, um, unemployment rates great, but you've now got Sydney in lockdown for a month, and and let's be honest, they're going to be in for for a lot longer uh, because numbers keep going up. What does that mean um, for unemployment in an environment where Commonwealth government payments? So you get a um, you get a weekly payment if you've if you've lost your job basically, um, or you, you can't work uh, because of the lockdowns um, in New South Wales at the moment. That's 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 a much smaller level than it was last year. So you've got yep, unemployment's been low, but the level of support for people who are in lockdowns is also much lower. So that increases the the risks. And that, I think, is, is going to be the major challenge. Q3 GDP, you know, let's face it, it's probably going to be negative. Um, but the question, I think, becomes, well, what happens in Q4? Uh, because, you know, the technical definition of a recession, you can argue about whether it's a reasonable one, is that 
it's two consecutive quarters of negative growth. So we really don't know at this stage what's going to happen in Q4. And, you know, there's a lot of uncertainties around the trajectory in New South Wales beyond beyond Q3. And also whether we have big outbreaks in other states. And I think, you know, it would be arrogant for anyone interstate. And I, I live in Victoria um, and we've just, we've just shut down a Delta outbreak, fingers crossed here. But it would be arrogant to think that what's happening now in Sydney couldn't happen elsewhere or couldn't happen in a regional area or couldn't happen in Western Australia or something. So, you know, there are risks. But on the other hand, um, we've seen a much more rapid recovery. In, and what our NAB data shows, I look at a lot of the NAB consumption data, it shows that when lockdowns end, people go hog wild, basically. You know, my social calendar, every time we have a lockdown, in my social calendar is full for two weeks and I'm exhausted at the end of it. People go out and they spend money. So, you know, when this ends, I think, you know, we have every confidence that there should be a recovery in activity. The thing that makes me nervous is that there is really a lack of, um, a lack of income support this time um, compared to last year. Um, you mentioned official interest rates, but the RBA has done basically everything it can uh, there's no more firepower, uh, monetary policy-wise, you can chuck at this. Uh, and, and that's, I suppose, sort of the, the challenge. But for agriculture, it's a really, really different story because, you know, a dollar at, you know, 74, 75 cents, fantastic season. I mean, really fantastic season. Uh, and commodity prices that are, that are just looking, I mean, for cattle prices are unprecedented. You know, that's, that's a very different scenario to if you're running a restaurant in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. So, you know, the overall macro picture sometimes doesn't show exactly people's circumstances. It can overestimate how good things are for some and underestimate it for others. One of the things that interests me was, when I was looking through this data, was government debt to GDP sitting at around about 25%. How does it compare to the rest of the world? Like, for instance, the USA, Europe, other developed economies. Uh, Australian government debt is very low by global standards. Now, US, it's much higher. Japan is sort of the record one for government debt uh, or close to it, but it's largely held by Japanese people or or the Bank of Japan. So Japan is sort of a a different example. Europe has challenges. Um, The challenge for Europe is because they have a common currency, um, it makes it more difficult for them to individual governments to manage um, government debt because of limits they put on it and so forth. The US, of course, can have a very large government debt because it has the world's global reserve currency and um, unless people abandon the US dollar, they have no trouble They have no trouble increasing it, basically. There's no doubt we've increased government debt substantially. Is it high by global standards? No. Is it high by Australian historic standards? No. Let's flip it over and think about the counterfactual. What would the situation be like now for the macro economy? And we just talked about how good it was the unemployment rate was below 5%. That's a fantastic number. If the Commonwealth government and state governments hadn't spent a ginormous fire hose bucket of cash, we wouldn't be seeing the economic outcomes we are seeing. So, you know, if there's any time to spend, it's now. I suppose that you know, goes back to you. So it looks like we're done and dusted from a monetary policy perspective because, as you said, the Reserve Bank's got nowhere to go, but we've still got a bit of firepower left from a fiscal policy perspective if we cho- so choose to stimulate through government spending. Would that be a a reasonable call? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, the RBA has been doing two kinds of monetary policy. They do the traditional monetary policy, which is the control of the cash rate. So it's official, uh, you know, sort of official interest rates, if you will. And they also have now, since the pandemic started, unconventional monetary policy. Now, what is unconventional monetary policy? What the RBA is basically doing is they're going into secondary markets and they are buying bonds, you know, predominantly they're buying federal government, state government bonds. Um, you know, you also unconventional monetary policy has seen private bonds bought overseas and so forth as well. Uh, they basically create that money out of nothing. They just put a few zero, you know, ones and zeros in a, you know, in the ledger. Um, they buy those bonds, and that increases that increases the money supply. So, um, what you're seeing at the moment is this unconventional policy also by the RBA that's being wound back a little bit. But, you know, they've said that conventional monetary policy, i.e. the official interest rate, is going to be on hold until 2024, which is unprecedented to say, for them to say, we're going to keep interest rates at basically zero for, for three years. Now, um, we haven't talked about the dollar yet in great detail. So, so just, mm. so, so Finn, for, for just the uninitiated, yeah. a bond is basically debt, isn't it? So Treasury, yeah, right. uh, so the Federal Treasury is buying uh, state and federal debt 
and giving them cash or, uh, as you say, secondary markets. So that that's what is that companies as well, or how's that work? So basically, say I'm I'm the the federal government or a state government, right? So let's just say federal government. Um, I issue bonds because we talk about government debt. How does government debt get issued? Um, the, co- the the government issues a bond, which says it's basically an IOU. Really, it says um, I will pay you. Uh, you will give you will give me this money. Um, and I will pay you back in X years. You could have a 10-year bond. I think they have three-year bonds, you know, that kind of thing. And I will pay you back this money in at X date with, 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 with interest. Now, those bonds are then traded on secondary markets. People buy and sell government bonds between each other, and, and they will have a price associated with them. Now, what the RBA, uh, the central bank, is doing is going into secondary markets, financial markets, and buying government bonds which is a roundabout way of giving the government money from nothing. Now, the, gov- the, the RBA could yep. you know, later on sell those bonds, so it might not keep the balance sheet at the level that it's currently at, uh, but for the moment, it's creating money and giving it to the government via a roundabout mechanism, in effect. Interesting. So, again, so um, where are the, who are they borrowing off to buy the bonds? The RBA, they're yeah. not borrowing from anyone. They're just making up the money. So, you know, the, the, oh. um, the RBA issues Australian dollars that we have, we have a monopoly, you know, the, the government creates money, basically, it can create money. They just yep. put numbers in a, in a spreadsheet. So that money is, is created uh, by the central bank, in effect. It's not like that there's some fixed pool of money in the world um, and that it all has to even up. What's happening is that central banks throughout the world and, you know, the Europeans and the Americans really pioneered this. Well, actually, the Japanese started doing it before that, but... You know, um, central banks are basically creating creating new new money um, and putting it into financial markets. So the concept of the gold standard is well and truly gone, dead, buried, cremated. Um, it was, I mean, gold standard was dead. You know, by the by the seventies. Well, Nixon killed it at the end of the sixties in the late, you know, early seventies. And you know, this is this is going to get yep. very boring. And I have a I have this <laughs> sense that listeners are going to hang up. Let's go. No more. We don't want to hear this. Uh, but you know, there was a gold standard. You had. After the Second World War, this Bretton Woods system of fixed fixed exchange rates, that's long gone. But, yeah, basically, yep. central banks can create money. Now, it has limits. Look at Zimbabwe, for example, um, you know, with hyperinflation because they keep printing the money. Uh, you, you can't keep doing it forever. Uh, but, you know, central banks that do a small amount of it and do it, you know, pay it back, um, who have credit, seen to buy markets that have credibility and can keep their exchange rate... Um, at a certain level, because the exchange rate's really where it gets you. They can they can do that. So, again, so the inflation rate's an important issue here with regards to money, but obviously at an inflation rate of 1.1%, it's not something that we're worried about at the moment. Are, are we looking at inflation rates rising over the uh, near, to, near, near to long-term future? or Well, the House view is that inflation is not likely to be a problem, and there was a lot of talk in the media three months ago, two, three months ago, about inflation, that inflation was going to come back, is going to wreck us. But it, it hasn't sort of showed up. It's showed up a bit in the US um, and it's showing up in certain parts of the Australian economy. So, you know, um, anyone who's tried to buy farm equipment recently will know that it's really hard to get farm equipment. You want to buy a ute, really, you know, difficult and they're getting more expensive. So it's showing up in vehicles, equipment. Well, the second-hand um, se- second vehicle market. Second-hand vehicles, I've tried to yes. buy a vehicle recently. I, I sold, at a I sold price. two four-wheel drives this year and uh, got a very good price of both of them. So it is it is unprecedented times because of supply shortages because, you know, factories got closed down yep. due to COVID. You've got this global semiconductor shortage, uh, which means that the little computers that are in cars are not available. It's a perfect storm of a sort of maybe a transitory event which pushes up the price of things. But, you know, what about other stuff? Where, you know, is are we seeing economy-wide... Um, in you know, in f- consumer price inflation, well, it doesn't seem to be there. Now, you might say, oh, well, hang on, the value of my farm has doubled over the last year or the value of my capital city house has gone up X percent. That's, that's inflationary, isn't it? Well, no, because the CPI, when we talk about inflation, we're talking about the consumer price index. That's, um, that's a very narrow, more narrow measure of inflation that includes as- excludes asset prices. So... Why don't they update that? I mean, I, I know it's one of those questions. I'm, you know, bread, milk, and sort of the basket of food goods. I mean, yeah. gee, there's a lot of inflation that happens that are outside that basket of goods, isn't there? 
Yeah, it's not a cost of living measure necessarily. It's a it's a measure yeah. of a basket of consumer goods, uh, and that changes over time, and the weightings change over time. So you know, um, it's not the, the CPI now. We're not measuring what we were measuring fifty years ago exactly, but we've never included yeah. housing. Uh, but we, we include the cost of building works, and we include rental costs. But we don't include house prices or land prices in that because it's a measure of the the rationale is it's not a consumer price it's a it's basically it's an asset. Now, is that reasonable? Um, well, it depends on what you're trying to measure. Are you trying to measure a, a narrow thing that economists can get excited about, or are you trying to measure how easy it is to live and and how easy it is to get by in a, you know in life? And the latter is very different from the former. So. The reason why I've spent a bit of time on inflation is obviously inflation has a relationship, and again, happy for you to correct me if I'm wrong, inflation has a relationship to interest rates yep, that's and right. currency, do- that's doesn't right. it? So, and both those two things are important to farmers. Absolutely they are. So if I'm, if I'm reading this correctly, um, we're not expecting inflation rates to rise. Not to the point where it would mean that the RBA is going to get really constrained. Okay. So, interest rates. Then, um, what's 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 the house call on interest rates? The house call is on hold until probably sometime in twenty 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 three or into twenty twenty four. The RBA will want to maintain credibility on this, so they will basically keep their word and not rise, you know, raise them for a while. Uh, but when they do go, they might move probably faster than people expect. Um, one thing I would draw people's attention to is Canada and New Zealand, which are pretty comparable economies are now thinking about what's the next step in terms of interest rates um, and moving higher first. So I think we'll be looking to see what happens in Canada and New Zealand there. But, you know, our house view is basically that they are going to be on hold for a couple of years now. Okay, so that then leads into my last one in this trifecta, currency. Uh, Around 74 cents, maybe a bit lower, is a pretty sweet spot for agriculture, I would have thought. Yeah. What's the likelihood for it to remain around there? Well, I'll, I'll... I'll put this out there. We, until quite recently, had assumed... We, we've just revised our, for, our FX forecasts at the bank because we thought it was going to be 80 cents at the end of end of Q2, so the end of June. Uh, instead, it was mid-70s, and we thought 83 by the end of the year. We've changed that view. And I want to take you through why we've changed that view because I think it has some interesting signs about where we think it's it's headed. What's happened since June has been two, I think, key events in FX markets. One is uh, the June um, FOMC meeting of the US Fed, the um, Federal Open Market Committee. They're basically, they're just asking people about what they think interest, US interest rates are going to do. And it was a little bit more bullish in terms of US rates than the market had expected. And that set the US dollar off on a, on a pretty, pretty big tear. US dollar had been very suppressed and that had been the key driver of you know, Australian dollar strength before that. Now, what's happened since then you have the FOMC meeting, gets the US dollar going. But what's happened since then is this emergence of the Delta variant of coronavirus is is really throwing a spanner in the works in a lot of countries. Delta is probably at least twice as infectious as the original Wuhan strain of the virus. So it's much more infectious. Now, twice as infectious doesn't mean twice as many cases. These, these viruses behave exponentially, not linearly. So it means much, much worse outcomes, all things being equal. That um, means that risk, you know, risk sentiment has, you know, has been reduced. People are less keen to buy risky stuff. They want safety. The US also is looking pretty good in terms of its post-virus recovery because of vaccination. Basically, everyone who wants to get a coronavirus vaccine in the US has already got one. Um, and so there's been this sort of flight to safety, if you will. What does that mean for the Australian dollar? Well, our house view is, I think now it's about 78 cents at the end of this year and, and 80 next year. So a little bit of appreciation, but this is really a very a very nice place to be for Australian agriculture, uh, FX-wise. Um, if it gets really, really low, say it were 50 cents or something, we've had 50 cent, you know, dollar, that was great, but input costs start to be a problem. And that's, I think, what you've got to start worrying yeah. about. Yeah, no, I, 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 I was a banker, at a regional manager during those periods up in the cotton industry, mate. It was, mm. uh, especially when people start playing around with uh, currency hedges. Um, it was, it was a disastrous time. But anyway, yeah. that's yeah, that's that's, right. that's a nightmare I'll, I'll bring to another podcast. Indeed. <laughs> mm. Okay, so we've got the we've got we've got the macro picture. 
let's now look at agriculture. So, uh, again, I, I don't want to ignore the elephant in the room, which mm. still would have to be China, wouldn't it? China's a big deal. There's no doubt about that. And it's affected certain bits of agriculture more than others. So, you know, if we'd had this conversation a year ago, I would have been really worried about barley because, the you know, three quarters, two thirds of three quarters of our barley used to go to China uh, or barley exports used to go to China. And my view was, well, it's going to be really hard to find new markets for that. What actually happened was uh, we got some really good new markets in Saudi Arabia. They had a feed barley series of contracts. And also Central America, we were sending, you know, barley to Mexico to put in Corona. So the beer, not the, <laughs> not the virus. Uh, but, you know, that's, you know, that's been a great, um, a great series of opportunities for us. Now, um, we, what we've had on our side has been this global commodity price boom that's meant that the global grains complex has got a lot higher. Um, demand is there. People want to hold physical product because they're nervous in, you know, the pandemic about about actually being able to take physical delivery. You've got these high shipping costs. So we were retimed it really well. Now, if you're in the wine industry or in seafood, China is still a really serious problem. But in other areas, it hasn't it hasn't bitten in the way that it could have, which has been which has been good. Again, and again, in, in my reading of, of commodity prices, if I look across most commodities, they're, they're, they're up in the sort of eight plus uh, decile, except, and I should know this, uh, for broad wools, which is probably in the one decile, but obviously we're compensating that because of prime lamb prices. But I, 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 and I might be looking through rose-tinted glasses, but I've never, I, I can't remember a, period when across the board prices are being so good no it's about as good as it gets i reckon at the moment price wise and it's not just prices being good and they are good it's that prices are being good at the same time yeah. we're having a great season and that's the the combination i think which is really really interesting um you mentioned wool you know um certainly anything sort of sub 20 micron has performed really well but but anything above it's not um, which is a challenge, but yeah. then lamb looks so good. It's it's very hard to find uh, a, a an area doing it tough in Australian ag at the moment, apart from you know things like wine or seafood, yeah. where China has really hit them. You know, you look at um, proteins, all all looking great. You know, cattle prices yeah. are phenomenal, uh, which is uh, you know whether you think that's sustainable. Well, that's a, that's an interesting issue. Let's just focus but, on that. We've know, got the ekis uh, at at over ten bucks now. Um, I've got to be yeah. honest. Um, that does make me. I, I'm, I'm, I've got some young cattle that I, I want to sell, which I'm, I'm looking forward to. No doubt, and you are. certainly the yes. stocky, stocky saying that it'll last. <laughs> um, but gee, that's high, and I don't know yeah. how anyone makes money down the line. I've been saying it's too high for a long time, and I've been wrong for a long time. So I'll put that out there. But. It is too high. <laughs> You'll be right one day. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, what's the thing about economists? They predict the last 10 of the last one recessions or something. But um, <laughs> it is high. It is very high. It's, it's uncompetitive for processes and it's completely detached from global fundamentals. Um, now, we yeah, think global that's fundamentals... that's the issue about that global yeah, relationship. That's right. Now, higher global grain prices is going to put upward pressure on global cattle prices probably at some point. And, you know... There are still supply, more supply constraints in South America than I probably would have expected at this point. But when those, you know, when the pandemic subsides, there's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of supply coming online in the Americas. So, you know, and then you've you've got this question around pork prices in China. I don't know if you've been following that, but you know, I think it's too high. I think it's entirely restocked de demand, um, and that's fine when you're restocking. But you have to remember that a restocking process nationally is a three to four year process you've got parts of new south wales parts of queensland which have which have just been completely destocked and now they're trying to get back yep. in dipping their toe back in the water that's risk for them but i can't guarantee what the season's going to be like in 18 months uh and yep. that's the challenge if you've uh bought in now uh, and you're on a rebuilding cycle now or something well you know you've got to be making those decisions for years out are, the, are seasonal conditions going to be good in two years i couldn't tell you uh, and that's the challenge for the rebuilding cycle for the herd, and that's the challenge for the sustainability of Eki where it's at. So on the grain side, mate, we, we're sort of getting uh, closer to the pointy end, and so we're starting mm. to get a fairly good feel, pending any major climatic disaster, of 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 what the um, our crops are going to be like. And I, I think most of them are looking pretty good. 
Yeah. What's happening definitely. around the rest of the world? What 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 type of market are we going to be selling those crops into? So, if you look around the grounds uh, with the rest of the world, the Americas. So, South America's had some real challenges. Now, they're not. It's not so much a wheat issue, but you know, corn and soybeans, for example. Um, there's been some real challenges there, and that's that's pushed the global grains complex higher. Um, Brazil, in particular. Uh, you look at Canada at the moment and canola. I don't know if anyone's been following canola prices, but they yeah. have been on an absolute tear. Um, I haven't checked the absolute latest, but it was sort of seven fifty, eight hundred bucks a ton, which is phenomenal. Um, a big driver of that has been what you've seen in oilseed markets. You've got uh, you can't get labour in Southeast Asia for palm oil because of um, Indonesia and Malaysia having major coronavirus surges. Um, and Canada, I don't know if anyone's been looking at Canada, but they've been getting you know temperatures like forty seven to fifty degrees in parts of Canada. Mm. So Canada, yeah. a major canola producer, their crops, you know, you've got to be worried about that, right? So that's yeah. been driving these high canola prices. European wheat has had um, some opportunities and some challenges. You know, last year there were a lot of you know, a lot of problems for black sea wheat, for example. And then, and this hasn't been discussed enough, I don't think, is shipping costs. Shipping costs used to be low. Uh, for about 10 years, we overbuilt shipping capacity in the lead-up to the GFC yep. for both bulk carriers and containerized uh, freight. But since this pandemic, shipping costs have gone through the roof, you know, for some people like quadrupled. So I saw um, I saw a graph yesterday about container costs into China and container costs out of China China yeah. and they were huge to get them out of China. Yeah. Well you remember the um say three or four years ago, you remember a lot of growers in the Melly Wimmera were doing containerized grain yep. because they could re- it was a really cool way of um, being able to manage things um, financially because you could just go, I'll just get a container of grain and I'll put it on a truck and send it down to Geelong or Melbourne or you know, or, or Melbourne if it's if it's a um, container um, question, not Geelong. But um, you know, and I can I can really aggressively play in the market. Well, guess what? You can't get a twenty foot container now. So the containerized yep. grain trade dead, stone called dead, um, and bulk carriers are really you know really up there as well. But that's not a big inherently a big problem for Australia because look at WA wheat belt, for example, you, you know, its traditional strength was proximity to places like Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, etc., um, and also to the Middle East. Now, Black Sea wheat, which was putting us under huge pressure in Southeast yes. Asia because it was so cheap. Uh, and we've had this discussion before how cheap Black Sea wheat was. Well, guess what? All of a sudden Black Sea wheat has become hard to get. You had Russia doing these export bans um, or export restrictions I should say, and, you know, all of a sudden shipping costs have gone through the roof. So that says great times for West Australian grain growers because you've got this more captive market to sell into. So high, high shipping costs is an opportunity as well as a challenge. Yeah, so is, is, is China been a big player in, in the grain uh, in the grains oil seed markets too, buying, buying stock? Yeah, China's, China's been on a, on a real tear with purchases, uh, particularly corn and soybean. Um, sort of um, uh, inventory replenishment kind of stuff. So, look, that is um, that's a big deal. Certainly, um, whether that continues, I don't know. So, there's certainly no sort of in 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 the sum brief summary that we've we've taken from mm. the commodities from the grains perspective. Yeah. I'm not hearing any typical economic pessimism about well, we're all going to hell in a handbasket because of this. No, not at all. I actually think that. Our forecasts, I think that you could see, you know, where East Coast, you know, wheat prices or, you know, depending on what it is and where it is, you know, in the, in the you know, low to mid 300s this season, which is, you know, given that we're going to look at a wheat crop of high 20s into the 30s potentially, a yep. phenomenal result. So, you know, I feel really good about where grains are at at the moment, which is probably the kiss of death for them. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the one challenge I would note is that, Chinese buying activity has been really high, but then the Chinese government has been cracking down on speculators, you know, a whole host of commodity yep. areas, or what they say are speculators. What they really mean is they want to get prices down. Um, now, it's not guaranteed that they keep buying. We've seen plenty of markets like wool two years ago or dairy in 2015 to 2016 where they just stopped buying, uh, and that has calamitous effects. I don't think we're going to see that with grain in the same way, though. So I, I, I feel pretty good about it for this season. Um, next season, I couldn't tell you, but I think at the yeah. moment you'd be pretty, pretty, pretty happy with where grains are at. So, just moving on and probably f- uh, finish up on this lot because mm. we, uh, but certainly dairy and and 
The prices I'm seeing being quoted for milk solids at the moment from the factories is, is, is again, nothing to be sneezed at. Fantastic. I mean, dairy has had so many challenges, um, particularly Northern Vic dairy, Southern New South Wales dairy. And then you've got tro- subtropical dairy has got structural issues. But um, no, it's great. Um, great times for dairy. The latest global dairy trade auction results have been sort of a little bit mixed to negative in the last couple of months. But, you know, that Australian dollar going down has certainly helped. Opening prices yep. have been in the high sixes um, yep. for a lot of... In fact, um, Fonterra and um, uh, Saputo, which is, you know, what Murray Goulburn used to be, uh, mm. uh, had to revise up the opening prices very rapidly because they were getting priced out by the processes. So just to maintain milk flow. Now, does that get us back to that nine, I think it's billion litres is what we used to do, and then we got into the yep. eights. Does it get us back to nine? I don't know. Um, the other side of the coin on dairy and why I'm quite optimistic about dairy is uh, feed grain prices. You know, we talked about grain prices being high and going up. But compare that to two years ago where you had domestic grain at over $400 a tonne because of feed demand in New South Wales and Queensland. I actually think that the the, the input cost side for dairy has come off substantially. Irrigated yep. areas, lower water costs, uh, lower feed costs. Um, dairy producers are, are, are looking at some of their best conditions in probably six or seven years at the moment. I did say that was going to be last, but I'll go one more last question while I've got you, mate. Pigs in, in China. Um, yeah. I, I seem to get two different views. One is that, that, that there's a rapidly building breeding and it's going hunky-dory. Then I hear actually know that they actually haven't got the, the, the um, African swine fever. It's, I always get fever and flu mixed up. I always up, get so confused fever. flu and fever. Um, a, yeah. we'll just call anyway, whatever it is, you know. yeah. Yeah, it's not as, as under control as is what they're letting us know. In fact, the, 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 the numbers are not building up quite as well as, as, as that would let us, uh, what would they'd like it to be. You get any mail on that? Uh, well, no more than you are, and probably nothing reliable, to be honest. I think there's a lot of uncertainty, yeah. which, is the, which, is the, uh, which is the sophisticated way of saying, I don't know, but... <laughs> All I can do is point you to Chinese, you know, pig prices, domestic pig prices. Yep. That ASF boom that you saw, which saw a massive increase in pig prices, has basically yep. completely unwound because the Chinese government said, oh, we're going to crack down on speculators. Now, the story that I've heard is that what they're doing is they're bringing forward slaughter uh, to beat, to like basically beat the regulatory crackdown so they can get more money. Now, that's a cycle yep. <laughs> which is um, sees... Oh. Um, <laughs> deflating, you know, lower, lower prices <laughs> until you run out of pigs <laughs> and then you've yep. got a risk around around um, herd size and stuff. But the status of ASF and how under control it is, is, is a re- there's a real uncertainty about that. And, and I think that uncertainty is a challenge for sure. Finn, always a pleasure. And there's a lot of other things that we could talk about. But uh, as I said, I think that's probably enough for today. Um, really appreciate your insight and thank you once again. No worries, David. Happy to be on the podcast. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this week's Marcus Ag Talk podcast. Please, any feedback on the series would be greatly appreciated. You can either leave a message on this site or email me at cornish at marcusoldham.vic.edu.au. Stay tuned to next week's podcast as we continue to explore farm management from an Australian perspective.